going to move us along to um, uh, another map a little just three years later, Metro Boston. And that's not a bird's eye view, that's actually um, just a map. Well, it happens to come from the first Middlesex County Atlas that was produced. Uh, mapping uh, really came into uh, being uh, popularized, let's say, let me put it that way, after the Civil War, uh, early 1870s, uh, books of maps or atlases were done throughout the U.S. So it was not just Boston, it was Nebraska, it was the West Coast. Uh, this was uh, a rapid industry, uh, mainly to record the, the progress in terms of our uh, uh, industrialization as a country. And so these maps, or books of maps, were produced by civil engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were entrepreneurs, so they would go out and fund the surveys, uh, come back with the data, uh, draw up the plans, and from there do the steel engravings. Mm -hmm. And after uh, they went to the printing process, as you see on this particular map, there was watercolor applied. And so that adds another element of aesthetics to these plates. They were done for a reason. It would show uh, various portions of uh, the uh, geography, but nonetheless, uh, very uh, beautiful to look at. This particular map w was a fold-out map and quite large. It's pr pr uh, you don't see all of it here. It's probably uh, 30 inches wide by uh, uh, 36 mm. inches uh, uh, long. Yeah, let's go look at some details here. Um, this is what you would now be the, the bridge closest to up would be the, the Longfellow Bridge. Um, it still has here the name of the West Boston Bridge uh, before it was named and rebuilt as the Longfellow Bridge. And um, you mentioned the, the beauty and the, the size of these maps. Um, we have some maps um, that we have in our office and what we do, we put them on our conference table and then put mylar on top. And whenever we have a meeting, people love figuring out, oh, this is how it looked like. So it, it's always a conversation piece and it's, people love maps. Uh, I mean, this is really a, a something that links you with a place and with history. I think you uh, uh, bring up a very important point. And uh, one of the main reasons I feel map collecting is important to me, and I think others, I think it's one of these uh, uh, innate, uh, 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 it's common to all of us in terms of wanting to uh, place ourselves in context of our environment uh, and also in this continuum of time that we're just here at a certain point in time and really are caretakers for our environment as we progress through time. So it's a freeze frame way of looking at where things were yeah. and where we are today in the scheme of things and maybe try to project into the future yeah. how things will be. Again, we see all that rail, railroads crossing out of North Station over to the North Point you know, at some stage there were 20 railroads. I think right now we only have two more railroads there. Um, and we even have a close-up here um, of what's of the Longfellow Bridge. And then on the Cambridge side is what now is the Broad Canal, uh, which now even has a canoe and kayak rental place and this wonderful walkway so that you can experience the, uh, the water. And there will be a restaurant on the water. So this, this shoreline, has changed and I think very faintly marked in there it shows of how the land will be filled in in the future. Well you see the level of detail here which is really remarkable considering the size of this map and uh, you start to see uh, the rivulets, uh, the, the formal structures being created and along with this you can just start to imagine the manpower and the amount of labor <laughs> and design and planning uh, I mean, we think of the Big Dig and some of these other pro more recent projects, but imagine all of these activities going on at once and all the, uh, uh, the design work yeah. and the construction work being done all at one time. Yeah, and, and of course, East Cambridge is going through yet another planning process, not just North Point Park, uh, but also the whole Kendall Square area mm. is being replanned to really make that a place that's exciting um, not just from 9 to 5, but 
we'll have residencies, restaurants. Mm -hmm. So the planning process goes on. And the river is always a very important part because this is what I think in, in a way distinguishes Cambridge from many other cities. We're so fortunate to have the river. So um, let's look at yet another map. We're now in the 20th century. And this map um, really looks at, at the plans for when they planned the, the, the dam. dam. That's the correct. dam, that's this, right. This uh, comes from the 1903 uh, Charles River Dam Report, which is uh, an extremely <clears throat> detailed text of the uh, uh, ration, rationalization in terms of why uh, the dam, uh, the pros and cons of uh, constructing the dam. Uh, there are obviously uh, health issues, uh, combined sewer overflows. As we said before, a lot of these areas were tidal, so they were exposed to the air uh, well, at low tides. I'm not even sure that at that time it was combined. I think it was, it, 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 it was just one overflow. It was pretty much all sewage, and then they started to separate it into storm water and, and sewage. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the planning process here, I mean, the, the book itself goes into many aspects. Uh, certainly the health uh, was one. Uh, and the way to achieve that was to raise the water elevation or to keep a lot of this underwater. Yeah. And one of the options was, do we excavate the muck or do we just bring up the water right. level? And uh, obviously the dam was what they uh, proposed to do. And this shows the basin that would be created. Actually, in doing this, the research at the time, and we have a lot to be thankful for, for our uh, planners of 100 years ago, because they researched what was being done in Europe. And a lot of uh, uh, these activities uh, were referenced to similar type projects done in Europe yeah. and how they could also be used for public uh, recreation. Yeah. So this whole concept of taking something that was primarily being used for industrial purposes mm -hmm. or as a receiving yeah. basin for waste could actually lead to public pleasure. Yeah. And this is uh, in Carl Hagland's book, he describes um, particularly Hamburg, which has the yes. Ulster, which have a similar situation. And, and they um, created these parklands. And when um, Charles Elliott, the landscape architect, traveled to Hamburg, says, this is what we need for the Charles River. So we are very fortunate of, um, that these parallels were made. And uh, the, uh, the, the pleasure aspects, I think, was really maybe necessary politically to sell this uh, so that everybody would re achieve some benefits. I mean, this was at a time when most people were working six days a week. So any, spirit, any time for recreation was, yeah. I'm sure, very highly prized. Now, speaking of recreation, uh, people did swim in the trials. Um, all these all these years up to 1955, not because the Charles was clean, but people didn't know it was dirty. But um, on June 4th, the Charles River Swimming Club and the Charles River Conservancy organized a swim race. So now, actually, the water is clean enough most of the time to swim. So um, we I have think, come a long way. I think I heard the most recent rating is a B plus. I think that That's was done right. by the EPA. Which it's is done by EPA, excellent. and it 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 will probably go higher quickly. There were some very rainy days mm -hmm. in the winter, but um, I, I think that the water quality is getting better and better. And the Charles River Conservancy is testing the water every day, so we have reliable and predictable um, data, so that we know. Um, when it's safe to swim. So that's happening. But let's move our forward in our um, plans. Here we have this of the same map from 1902. We have this yeah. map upriver, which has a little bit of Cambridge in it as well. There's the magazine beach at the, at the bottom right. And then um, the river becoming very windy and where Harvard University is now expanding on the south side, Alston Brighton. It's still all marshland. And um, the Mount Auburn Cemetery is already in there. And um, a lot a lot of the a lot of the configurations have changed. Now I hope um, that that um, you have been sufficiently intrigued by the maps. 
and that you want to know more about the maps. And we have the information here of John, if you want to email him. Um, we call him the map man. It has your phone number and your email there. And then, of course, uh, at Ward Maps, it's possible to buy some of these originals as well as reproductions. That's correct. Uh, uh, Ward Maps has taken much of my collection and digitized it. Uh, this is uh, the way of the internet, and I think uh, it's really popularized maps and brought it into the public domain. It used to be the kind of activity where you'd have to go to a certain uh, bookstore or an event to see the physical map itself, but today we have the benefit of the internet, and wardmaps.com is, I think, a wonderful site to peruse. and. What happens is, hopefully, you'll catch the bug, as I did. The, the more you see, the more you'll want to investigate further, and the more one thing leads to another. And uh, I've gone on to doing nautical chart collecting, uh, and so it, it's never-ending. And I'm sure uh, there's something uh, in, in there for everybody. In fact, a lot of people look for genealogy type of information, family <laughs> members that may have lived in certain towns or at a certain uh, period in time. Uh, so hopefully people will find something to relate to in all of this. Good. Uh, Good. Well, it has been a pleasure hearing your story. And um, in case you just joined us or might, might have missed um, the show, this show will be put on YouTube with the Charles River Conservancy on our website, thecharles.org, where you can see this show about mapping as well as many other shows about swimming, about planning in East Cambridge, about um, our volunteer program. There has been recently also a show about the underpasses, the advocacy to create underpasses along the Charles um, as the bridges are being restored. So um, they have, there are many topics that are of interest because the river really creates this wonderful opportunity. So. Um, I'm much appreciating you, John, coming in and sharing a few of your maps. But there are, as you say, there are many more out there. And I know um, if you are not um, have the budget to purchase original maps, they are now very good value reproductions. And, Absolutely. And they give just as Absolutely. much pleasure. Um, you might, just like we can't all buy Picassos, but prints do a pretty good job of getting us a sense of what's out there. In fact, uh, that's what I still collect, uh, the, what I consider to be uh, affordable. I mean, there's the uh, investment type grades where you get into thousands of dollars, and that's, yeah. that's not me. That's uh, not I you. Like well, I'm glad you're you, <laughs> okay. and so um, I hope you will explore those maps, and thank you again, John, you're for welcome, coming Renata. today. And, um, the, um, again, his information is here, and in, if you want to go then to YouTube, you would find that on the website of the Charles River Conservancy, thecharles.org, uh, where we also have a calendar of events, of Sunday games, of activities for seniors. There are a lot of things um, in addition to maps and activities. So thank you again, John, for coming in today. My pleasure.